Well, welcome everyone. I'm the third person to welcome you, but we are so excited for today's conversation for our next Real Leaders, Real Stories. And so today's format, we're going to have a, just a, a formal, informal fireside chat with my two lovely guests who I'm going to introduce here in just a minute. Uh, but we have a, a unique setup this morning, different than previous Real Leaders, Real Stories. We have a, about a couple dozen people joining us in person, and we have about 40 to 50 people joining us online. So as we're going about today, we'll have a, about a 40, 45 minute discussion about mental health, how it affects us personally, how it affects us as leaders, as community leaders. And then we'll have about 15 minutes at the end for questions. We want to make sure that everybody feels safe to ask questions and we recognize the topic that we are about to enter into is personal, is sometimes uncomfortable, is upsetting, is all of the above and more. And so at any point in time, if you feel that you just need to check out mentally or even physically, you have complete autonomy and freedom to do so, whether you're in person or online, you will not offend anybody here. We want to make sure, again, that we are creating safe spaces for everybody, but we're able to engage in sometimes challenging conversations. If you have a question and you're online, please put it in the Q&A feature. We will try to get through as many as we can at the end. If you have a question in person and you feel comfortable asking it, when we get to Q&A time, just raise your hand. We will send you um, a microphone and you can ask. If you feel uncomfortable asking a question in person, and that's completely fine, if you would just privately message Juanita or Trevor on Slack, we will make sure that that question gets up to me and that your identity is kept private. Okay, so I am excited to welcome Megan Hovius and Paul Ashley to today's Real Leaders, Real Stories. So Meg, I'm gonna start with you. Can you give us 30 seconds? We've already read your bio. We know how talented you are. 30 seconds of what you want us to know about you this morning. On the clock. Hi everyone. Um, as uh, Kristen mentioned, my name is Meg Hovius. Uh, my pronouns are she, they. I am a Hoosier by birth but I like to consider myself a chooser uh, in my adult life. I have uh, been living in um, Chicago and New York for the past uh, 12 years, but I am back after um, that hiatus, and I'm, I'm really excited to be here. Um, the one thing that I want to express in today's, in the context of today's conversation is um, that while uh, we'll be talking in length about mental health, I am not a licensed mental health professional, um, but rather uh, I come to this work through advocacy and public policy, pulling largely from my own experience. So I've been living um, for as long as I can remember with anxiety, panic disorder, and major depressive disorder. Uh, so I'll be talking very openly about that, but uh, there's a lot that I don't know um, as, as it relates to mental health, um, but I'm happy to be here and to be sharing my story. Well, we're excited. Thanks, Meg. Paul? What can we learn about you this morning? Well, I'm here to be a juxtaposition to Meg, who actually knows what she's talking about. No, I, I too am not a clinician, which will be no surprise to anybody who knows me, but I too have a personal journey of mental health in the workplace, and I'm willing to be vulnerable about that. I've found over the last couple of years that not only does it help others in their journey, it actually has helped me, which is, came as a bit of a surprise. Uh, you've seen our bios, but uh, the thing that a lot of people don't know about me is I have five children, I have three dogs, and most importantly, and it's a jump the shark moment, a pet rabbit that lives indoors 100% of the time who became my emotional support rabbit during the pandemic. What I recommend you never do in your life is get a, a rabbit and keep it indoors, okay? <laughs> don't try to take mine, Tuesday is mine, but don't ever get your own. And you didn't feel the need to bring your rabbit this morning? I actually have a, a, a harness for her and a leash where I can walk her around like a pet. It is pretty amazing, so next time. All right, perfect. Well, Meg, I want to start with you. So you started your mental health consultancy here back in 2019. And you say that you started it and it's committed to changing minds about mental health. So that leads me to believe that there are some misconceptions about mental health. So to set the stage, can you just share with us what is mental health? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so first and foremost, mental health is health. I think that we often um, create sort of this divide between 
physical and mental health um, through the way that we address mental health, the way that we think about mental health, the way that we talk about mental health. Um, and so a big part of the messaging that um, I'm working toward is just creating a sense of overall health and well-being and recognizing and acknowledging that mental health is health. Um, in addition to that, I think it's important to also recognize that mental health is very much a spectrum um, that can range anywhere from mental illness, uh, severe mental illness like schizophrenia or major depressive disorder, um, all the way to high emotional intelligence and high functioning. And so um, oftentimes I think that the sense is that mental health is this, this thing that we are aiming to achieve so we can work to um, you know promote different interventions in our own lives to achieve mental health um, whereas I've started to think about mental health as um, a journey that in a spectrum that people will fluctuate um, on throughout their lives dependent on so many variables and factors um, so I think that's a, just an important distinction as I think about mental health perfect thank you I know oftentimes mental health, mental illness are kind of used interchangeably, yep. synonymously, and we recognize they're not the same. For anybody listening that maybe did not have that language prior to 60 seconds ago, um, how would you encourage them? You're in conversations with leaders every single day around this important topic. Are you seeing people still trying to get an understanding of definitions, of language, of shared um, you know, experiences? And what would you say to somebody that maybe didn't previously know what mental health was and the differences between the spectrum? Yeah, that's a great question. I do think language is incredibly important and more so shared language. Um, and so I encourage leaders to uh, really work within their own organization to find that shared language, whether that be talking about mental health and mental illness or talking about your human design type or your astrological signs. Um, I think it's all a way to relate back to who we are as individuals and have that shared language. Um, so definitely super important um, but yeah I mean I think that too just understanding uh, the different facets of mental illness and how that shows up in the workplace um, is incredibly important because we oftentimes um, individualize mental illness in a way that um, it becomes more of a personality trait or considered a, a personality pitfall um, a good example is like someone who's consistently late to a meeting oh that person's just lazy or that person's unreliable well that person could be living with a mental health condition or a mental illness and so um, yeah recognizing that there are a, a variety of mental illnesses that could show up in the workplace through daily actions. Perfect. And I want to later address inclusion and um, equity around the role that we can all play. So, uh, so just know that's coming later. You've set that up already really well. <laughs> um, Paul, I want to go to you because you and I have known each other for several years. Um, it's been my pleasure. Thank you. Not yours. <laughs> um, notice how I said thank you. Um, and you have been unapologetic the last couple of years, Paul, about your journey as an adult with depression. And you really, your story, I don't want to say began, but it probably publicly um, really got launched in 2019. Can you share more about that? Sure. Um, so World Mental Health Day falls in October every year. And October of 19, this is uh, before the times, the pandemic times, yeah. Do you guys remember that? It was interesting. Um, I decided to post on LinkedIn uh, about my personal journey with depression during my adulthood. And I had never really hidden it, honestly, but I had never like publicly put it in the public square, uh, a business public square like LinkedIn. And the amount of feedback I got of like, thanks for sharing that, this was so helpful, very interesting, I had no idea, you know, it was, it was good stuff, right? Um, what that then led to was the Indiana State Chamber reached out to me in uh, late December of 19, again, pre the times, and said, hey, would you write a personal point of view about your journey of mental health? We're going to put it in Biz Voice magazine, which goes to tens of people in the state. And um, I wrote that, and it was sort of, this is my story. This is what's helped me through this. And guess when that thing released? It released in late February of 20 and hit most people's offices, desks in March of 20. And if you close your eyes and go back and think of March of 20, that was a hot mess. 
And so I got a lot of people reaching out to me like, oh my gosh, this is so helpful. Uh, and I, I, I obviously won't share the names, but literally people that are executives of well-known companies saying, this is the same story I have and I've been afraid to share it. Now I'm gonna share it, dot, 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 right? And that was really powerful. What I didn't expect to have happen, I, I knew it would help others. I didn't expect it would help me. And it allowed me to be my whole self and share my journey. And a lot of people would come up to me and say, I'm so surprised, Paul, you're, you're so outgoing, you're, you're so energetic, you're so fun to be around. It doesn't make sense that you suffer from depression. I'm like, that's the crazy thing. Both are true and at the same time, right? I suffer from depression. I have, actually, I won't say suffer anymore. I've, I've learned to say I have a journey with depression. I have a relationship with depression and I'm fun to be around at the same time which is like, well, that doesn't make sense. No, it kind of doesn't, but it does. You know, it's, it's my story. And what that's led me to be able to do is talk to other leaders, uh, other people, publicly speak about it. And my, I guess my goal, um, it clearly isn't a clinical goal, but it's, it's to start to remove the stigma. Because if I can talk about it as a, as a husband, as a father, as a community leader, as a business leader, and be like, hey, guess what? I, 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 I go to therapy, I, I take medication every day, and I, I suffer from depressive disorder. And I'm awesome. I hope that other people, and whatever, well, at least I think I am, um, other people can step up and say, hey, I have a struggle too that I, I've been hiding and I want it to come out in the open, right, when they're ready. Not that they have to do it when I'm ready, but that, that's been my journey. And that journey goes all the way back for me. It was 17. I was 17 years old when I was first diagnosed with depression. So literally, my entire adult life has been a, a friendship with depression. Well, Paul, take us through the catalyst for wanting to share your story. Because from 17 up until, I'm, I'm not going to age you, Paul, but it's been a, a few years. M much older than 17? I mean. I'm now 45, so yeah. So what was the prompting? What was, because it, it wasn't 2020 yet where we recognized, okay, I'm still maybe uncomfortable to have this conversation, but I can no longer shy away from it. Do you remember what it was inside you that compelled you to share your story? You know, honestly, it may have been the algorithm that was being used by LinkedIn that day. Honestly, I, I, I don't know what compelled me. Uh, it just felt like it was time and it was right. I saw some other things being posted on LinkedIn because it was, in fact, World Mental Health Day. And it was just, it was, and again, my journey, it was just time. I, I can't tell you that it was like an epiphany or a, a moment of brilliance. Like, so the algorithm of LinkedIn is what triggered it. <laughs> so now to your point, what's been interesting, like, you know, the pandemic has been awful. Uh, lives lost, economic challenges, just terrible stuff all around. In any, in any dark situation, there's always a silver lining, right? And I would say one of the silver linings I've found because of the pandemic is you now have a collective openness of business and organizational leaders to be willing to talk about m mental health, emotional well-being in a way that actually is productive. Not weird, but healthy and productive. Pre-pandemic, that was the exception, not the norm. Post-pandemic or in the pandemic and post-pandemic, it's becoming the norm and not the exception. That, that leaders of organizations and businesses are open and willing to talk about mental health in a productive way. Now, I would never wish the pandemic to get us there, but it happens to be a silver lining. That, that's what I noticed in my consulting. And we'll take that. We'll, we'll take that and run with it as a, as a long-term benefit. And one final question right now, Paul. How did you feel getting ready to share your story, getting ready to share your truth, getting ready to hit post? What were the emotions immediately right before and immediately after? Well, I think there was a, a certain amount of fear because there is, as much as we want the stigma to be zero, um, certainly at that time, I, I think it was collectively higher, but even now there's a little bit of a stigma still associated with it, especially for um, men. I think there's a false stigma that men get that maybe women don't get saddled with. Not that it's easy to share as a woman, but I think there's something different for a man perhaps. Um, so I was fearful, you know, would I be judged? Would it hurt me in my career? And then I hit send and there was nothing but goodness that came out of it, um, as, you, as you can see. So. Um, you know, when, when, you, when the algorithm, metaphorically, tells you it's time to share, have some confidence because it's, it's probably going to be okay. Thank you. Uh, so, Meg, I want to go to you now. What was your experience, what was your exposure to not mental health from a standpoint of a diagnosis and what you're going through, but education 
awareness, language. Um, what was that like growing up and how did it prompt you to start your now business here? Great question. Uh, in one word, non-existent, <laughs> I would say. I grew up um, not too far from here, about an hour north, so rural Indiana. Um, grew up in a low-income household uh, where talking about or expressing uh, concerns or sharing around mental health just was non-existent, especially when you're living paycheck to paycheck, you have six mouths to feed. Um, it was not topic of conversation um, in my household. Um, that being said, I early on um, showed signs of anxiety, signs of uh, depression and isolation, and I feel incredibly grateful for my parents for having recognized and acknowledged that um, and helping me seek uh, mental health care. So I think I was six or seven when I first when I saw my first child psychologist, um, but definitely did not keep up with any sort of mental health routine or exploration until I got into my late, uh, well, actually probably my early, early to late 20s. Um, so I talk about this often both through my consultancy and just everyday lives uh, or everyday life. I think it's really, really important that we um, have these conversations early and often with children um, at school, at the home, uh, wherever appropriate, to equip people um, at a very young age to be able to identify and communicate um, what's happening internally um, and how that relates back to uh, their world and their lives externally. Great, thank you. And what type of, I mean, you talked about six or seven is probably the earliest point you remember You know, going to, to see a therapist. What was the encouragement? What was the education for your for your caretakers, for your parents, for your guardians, because, you know, you being six or seven, a child, you know, you're a product of your environment, and, you know, you absorb everything around you. Was there any focus on your parents, not from a, a shame standpoint, not from a guilt standpoint, but like, this is how you can work with Meg, this is how you all can walk through life together, or was that really non-existent at the point? Non-existent. Um... You know, I feel incredibly grateful for having a highly emotional mother. I don't, a highly emotional, emotionally intelligent mother. I mean, to raise four kids. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's all, it's actually all of the things. I remember at a very young age too, um, being really turned off with how emotional my mother was. Like it felt like a sign of weakness to see her express emotions. And I think that that was um, a conditioning that was instilled in me at an early age, um, especially as a girl or as a woman to be like, okay, you want to like, play in a man's world, keep your emotions at bay. Um, and so, yeah, I don't think they had really any support, any guidance, ex aside from my mom just recognizing and acknowledging that the behavior that I was displaying was uh, potentially harmful to myself um, and to help navigate and figure out what the appropriate next steps were, which I imagine was not easy. Again, with, she had, we had, there were five, four of us under five, um, and they had in, in her early 20s, so I imagine that was not easy for her to navigate. Did she have an emotional support bunny? <laughs> no, but oh, she probably well, could have used one. I, I bet, I bet. <laughs> then and now, <laughs> bless her heart. So what was the prompting for you, really, to start here, your mental health consultancy? Is it something that early on in your journey as an adolescent, you said, I want to help people that are, are journeying through something similar to what I am? Or was it something completely different later on in your adult life? I think it was a little bit of both. Um, it's really hard to compartmentalize what happened in my early childhood versus what um, I've experienced more recently in life. But, um, you know, I think that that shift for me um, really probably happened in college, just getting inherently curious about the human mind and behavior, uh, and also really quickly recognizing and acknowledging that um, I am an introvert and also highly empathetic um, and so pursuing uh, a career in clinical psychology was just never an option for me I would be I, I would be wiped out after one one meeting uh, or one session with a client so um, I think I knew early on I wanted to have some sort of impact um, within the space of mental health how that actually has manifested itself has definitely grown and evolved over the years perfect thank you uh, Paul similar question I want to know, you said you were diagnosed at 17. Yes. So assuming you had symptoms prior to 17, 
Tell us a little bit about the environment that you grew up with, the language, the awareness, the understanding, and also how does that now impact how you parent your five children? Oh boy. I know. Oh boy. I, I, did, I wasn't, didn't know I was going to have to talk about how terrible of a parent I am. So um, family of origin can have a huge impact on mental health. Um, there's, there's also clearly something happening that is um, uh, nature related, right? It's, it's genetic, there's genetic markers. So particularly on my mother's side of the family, uh, there was pretty severe mental health for her and her three sisters, uh, including my mom. And I, I grew up in a household as an only child um, interesting story there. My wife, Amy, and I, both only children, got married. That's not that weird. Went on to have five kids. Okay, that's weird. Um, but growing up as an only child and, and uh, being a child of an alcoholic, and there's lots of research on children of alcoholism uh, and the impact that has on their emotional well-being and mental health. So both the genetic uh, disposition that I had uh, from family and the environment in which I grew up in uh, child of an alcoholic certainly contributed to uh, you know my depression being uh, present and really the the trigger event or you know kind of where it became like oh this is a problem it's something I I sort of saw in myself was uh, I I contemplated self-harm um, when everything around me looked to be good right you know good student athlete I know you're looking at me now like athlete are you sure bro yeah back in the day it was athlete um, and I contemplated self-harm, and that scared me. And I realized, wait a second, this, isn't, this, is, not a, this is not a place of health. This is not a place of well-being. And so uh, I was very blessed in that my best friend's father uh, was a world-renowned, I mean, like, literally, if you read books, you'll see his research, world-renowned child psychiatrist. So the only thing I knew how to do was um, reach out to him. Now, he didn't treat me because that would have been inappropriate, you know, clinically because of the relationship that I had with uh, with his uh, with his son, but Dr. Hussein is his, his name, Arshad Hussein. He connected me with some resources and made sure that I was cared for uh, in a way that was helpful. But I will tell you that my my journey of depression didn't really get into to, to a place of stability and health until I was about 35. I mean, I, I, it really ebbed and flowed from 17 to 35. It was rough. Um, so that's my journey. Well, well, thank you. Um, Meg, you work with a lot of leaders. You know, you are working and you're committed to, to changing, um, you know, the language, the policies around mental health. How does leadership affect mental health? How does mental health affect leadership? What do you see in your work? Yeah, it's, it's, that is a really great question. And I think a, an interesting um, navigation, and it can be difficult to, to sort of parse out the differences between leadership, mental health impact and mental health leadership impact, is it is very much intertwined. Um, but I think that leadership can impact mental health in a lot of ways, um, obviously by modeling the behavior for others, you know, understanding uh, when you are in a leadership position that you have a lot of visibility to those um, around you and a lot of um, persuasion to those around you. So um, just recognizing and acknowledging that um, when you're in a leadership position, um, that there are direct impacts um, of, of direct impacts to the mental health of those that you're leading. Um, the leadership, how leadership, how mental health impacts leadership, um, I think is, is a really great question. And if you think about all of the roles that a leader is, is meant to embody, um, it's many. I mean, again, if you're an empath or if you're highly empathetic, um, knowing that part of your role will be to guide and influence others and to be a safe space for others, that can be inc incredibly taxing on your own mental health. Um, you know, thinking about decision-making fatigue and just being in a position where you are constantly um, asked to make decisions and move um, move things forward. I think that can also impact stress, burnout, um, general mental health. Um, so yeah, I think um, setting boundaries for yourself as a leader is incredibly important. And acknowledging and recognizing what your own limitations are is also really important. That sets my question up for Paul really well. Paul, you were in March 2020, pandemic hit. We got a new piece of vocabulary added of social distancing. And I remember you were very adamant. You said, I 
I journey with depression. While I need to stay an appropriate distance away from people, right. I need to physically distance from people. Again, you recognize language is really important for me. I don't need to distance myself socially. If anything, I need to stay more connected with people. And that was something initially right out the gate that you taught me. What are some other things that either since 2020 or even previously that you do personally and professionally, some of those self-care, some of those boundaries that would be helpful for those here today. Yeah, somebody who is an extrovert and needs connection to be healthy, social distancing scared the poopy out of me. Um, so I made you call it uh, physical distancing and social connection, uh, which helped me. I, I think back to your original question about mental health, this is another phraseology, you probably heard me use it. I think mental health is an umbrella, and I think on sort of one end you have the, the clinical side, which is mental illness, and the DSM-5, which is the Bible of mental health diagnosis, well, Bible is probably not the right word because there's, there's a lot of controversy about it, but there's the DSM uh, that's used clinically. And then I sort of, towards the other end, I, I think about emotional well-being, which is what you talked about, like total health of a person, which does include your emotions and your mental health. And so wh what I'm interested in at work is creating an emotional well workplace. I cannot and should not be a clinician. And so I can't get into the mental illness side. We have to have things that support it, of course, but that's not, that's not my place. That's a clinician's place. Um, so I think those are, those are things that, that come up for me, the emotional well-being. I don't know if I just answered the question or just went on a tangent there. No, you, you did a good job. It, <laughs> I'll, I'll share something that came to mind. Yeah. Uh, so we had gone virtual. Yeah. And one of the things that you had shared, a neurohack, you said, you know, because there's no longer a boundary, I can wake up at 6 a.m., I can open my computer, I can immediately start work, and I can work late into the evening because there's now, I'm always on. And you shared, okay, when, it, when kids are home from school, when we're transitioning to dinner, you were actively conscious about removing your shoes. You put your shoes on when you worked, even though you were at home. Never left the house. Never Nobody left the house. Nobody looked at my feet. Yeah. It, probably for good reason. Gross. Um, but you said, hey, I, I still might do some stuff in the evening, but this is my brain signaling, like my boundary. I am home. I'm with my family. I'm shutting off work. That was a neuro hack that you shared with me that I started to implement. Anything else that you found yeah, helpful during yeah, that time? I, well, the other thing too, and this is... Um, I don't know the actual psychology behind this, but in virtual environments using Teams or Zoom or turn, there, there always is a setting where you can turn the, the video of yourself off. It's, you have no idea how tiring it is to see yourself on a video while you're looking at other people. Well, you, when you're in a normal conversation in person, I cannot see myself right now. You, you see me, you can't see yourself. Well, for us to be in a Zoom environment where we constantly see our own image live while it's happening, while we're trying to focus on the conversation, there's a setting where you can, you know, turn yourself off. The camera's still on and people can see you, but you don't have to see yourself. That's a huge sort of tech hack that will absolutely just like reduce the anxiety of being on camera. It's, it's wild how different it feels. So if you haven't done that yet, do that. Um, the shoe thing worked for me when I, because we're in a hybrid environment now. So when I'm working from home, I put my shoes on when it's work time and I take them off when it's not. Um, that, that, that definitely still is there. And um, I'm lucky that I live in a place where if I go out of my house and just walk about, you know, two football fields, I can get into some woods pretty fast that has a creek in it. And nature is a beautiful medicine, even for just a second, to just stand in the woods, look up, sort of meditate for a second and walk back. So, um, you know, if you can get to a piece of nature, even if it's walking outside of your office and going to the landscape and sort of staring at the landscape inside an, uh, at an office building, that, that can have a huge impact on your emotional well-being. Meg, is there anything you want to add to that? Well, it sounds like your shoe hack was a lot healthier than my wine hack, which was that was my marker in the evening, like the glass of wine really kind of, um, for me, differentiated the, the start of the uh, or the, the end of the day. Um, <laughs> you just took your shoes off to do it. I, I, I forgot that part. Um, but I think as, as an introvert, in terms of boundaries, what I have learned is, um, you know, learning 
to set boundaries, learning to say no, um, learning to um, protect and preserve my own energy in a productive, healthy, and sustainable way. And I was really bad at that for a really long time. I'm still not great at it, um, but it's definitely a work in progress. And um, it, it's just that reframing of no doesn't, like sometimes saying no uh, to someone is actually the more productive approach to, to work in mental health. And if people that are here or online are wanting to have a conversation, and it, let me just say, we're not saying that you have to share about your journey with mental illness, but let's say they're looking for a more inclusive, equitable workplace around mental health. What are some things that they can do? What are some conversations that they can enter into? Who do they need to bring to the table? What encouragement would you give them there? Yeah, great question. So advocacy in the workplace, I think, is incredibly important. Um, and when I think about changing minds about mental health, that really, uh, there are two parts to that, because there's the individual change, right? There's the changing of our own minds, even physiologically, um, through interventions and modalities like meditation, cognitive therapy, those sorts of things. And then there's the, the collective changing of minds through destigmatization destigmatization, <laughs> um, as well as uh, really thinking, rethinking our structures and our work norms in a way that is healthier and more productive. And so um, just getting really curious about that, like I, I read a lot um, and listen to a lot of uh, podcasts on the future of work. So really considering um, who we are as human beings and the way in which we operate with each other in the workplace and what that could potentially look like in this new world that we live in. You know, you mentioned that the pandemic has certainly changed the conversation within workplaces. I think too, uh, this like new way of working or future of work and this new generation that's entering the workforce, Gen Z is talking about mental health. It is their lingua franca, as I like to say. They are very open about it and so, um, you know, just recognizing and acknowledging that things are changing at a fairly rapid pace um, and learning to explore ways to um, accommodate that change versus resist it, um, I think is really important. I'm going to start with you, Meg, but this is a question for both of you. Individuals here might be individual contributors, maybe they have a small team, maybe they have a large team, or maybe they're over their whole organization. What is the quote-unquote responsibility that a leader has as it pertains to trying to create a thriving mentally health, mentally, mentally healthy organization. Yes. Um, so I think that you bring up a good point in using the word responsibility because I think it is important to emphasize the responsibility is twofold. It is not fully on the organization or the leader to create psychological safety for their in, in employees. Um, and it's not and should not be fully on the individual to create psychological safety for themselves. Um, and I, what I've seen in a number of organizations is it does, it's one or the other. It's usually on the individual. Um, again, you know, like let's throw a wellness program um, into our environment. Um, let's offer meditation, Calm app. And that's really putting all of the onus on the individual to become a mentally and emotionally healthier person. Um, but it's just as important for, um, the, for leaders to educate themselves on mental health and mental illness, how that shows up in the workplace and become a little bit more aware of um, ways in which they can create that psychological safety without overstepping that boundary of, um, you know, therapy, uh, clinical um, interventions, because in a lot of instances, leaders are not psychologists and not therapists, uh, but recognizing signs and symptoms and knowing um, resources to point people toward, um, I think is a good, a good first step. And, and Paul, uh, before you answer that, we're going to transition in a few minutes to Q&A. So if you're online, put questions in the Q&A feature. Get questions ready here. Again, if you don't feel comfortable, privately message Juanita or Trevor on Slack, and we'll get those answered for you. Paul, what else can you share? So I think if you're in a, well, everybody's a leader, period. Whether you're in a role that's a leader or you're an individual contributor, you're, you are a leader. I think all of us as leaders uh, need to um, be authentic into who we are, right? And we need to be vulnerable 
in an appropriate way. That, right? I can. There are times I, I'm an overshare, so you can easily be too vulnerable and make things worse. Um, you certainly don't want to be a clinician. I echo that, unless you somehow have special training. And even then, it's probably not appropriate to be a clinician to your direct reports. Um, there are programs out there. Uh, a good example, and, and Kristen, you're, you're you're involved with this organization, but mental health first aid, uh, and and we are a huge advocate of it with our clients, and we actually use Kristen and others to provide that training. And what mental health first aid basically is is training anybody, but typically frontline leaders on just how to be aware and how to be comfortable in situations where they can identify uh, emotional well-being challenges or mental health needs and get those folks pivoted to resources in a productive way without stepping across the line, right? So it's easy to say, well, just don't step across the line and then, well, how do I actually do that? There actually is formal training uh, for mental health first aid that teaches people how to do that and not, uh, not sort of violate that clinical boundary. And, and we're huge, huge proponents. Do you want to share a little bit more about that because it's huge oh you, you did a great job did I, I didn't do it wrong you, no you did a great job oh, if good. anybody has any more questions about it feel free to talk to me afterwards or meg and we'll, we'll get you resources i available. think you're both trainers you guys are big deals thank you you said it paul thank you yeah paul because you work with so many leaders as it pertains to their benefit package as it pertains to their total rewards and everything that makes up their organization where could individuals go to seek some of these resources. If somebody says, hey, I don't even know what my employer actually has, what could be a good first step or what are some common things that you think are already available to them? Yeah, so most typically um, employers will have something called an EAP, Employee Assistance Program. And EAPs are, they're not all created equals, but they're generally free. That's a good place to start. I think the other, other opportunities you have are to connect with a leader that you trust, whether it's your direct manager or another leader that you've built a trust with and, and ask for help that way, uh, or peers that you know are on a journey as well. Uh, that can be good. If none of those work, hopefully you have um, somebody in a human resource type role in your organization that you can go to. They tend to have a little bit more knowledge and training about uh, some of the benefits that exist and, and the programs that exist. Um, I think being part of Edge, you can always turn to Edge too. It, Edge does a great job knowing some of the resources that are out there for individuals to get help and support uh, or organizations to get help and support. So I think that would be a list of things I would include. That's amazing. Meg, can you talk a little bit about policies and accommodations? Um, because maybe somebody says, well, you know, I work better in a certain environment whether that's because of access to light, whether that's because of reduction of noise. Um, what are some of those things that individuals can approach their trusted leader, whether that's a manager or somebody that they know can impact change? What are some ways that they can kind of better, um, you know, structure an environment that is conducive for a thriving, mentally healthy workplace? Yeah, great question. Um, so one thing that I've been doing more recently with um, organizations is creating what we call user guides um, for each individual. And so that really entails asking everybody in the organization a certain set of questions. So it can be really fun. Like we do like the 16 personalities um, uh, test online so that folks can better understand their own personality types, understanding communication styles, um, understanding learning styles, which is something we weirdly stop talking about when we're kids um, and never talk about in adulthood but um, you know recognizing that some folks um, have absorbed information and knowledge through written text whereas others um, are verbal learners some are kinesthetic some are um, visual and so um, just recognizing like what is it what is it like how do I operate best um, what are how do I function um, and then making that available and known to everyone and so like how this has worked in practice um, for me personally as a leader um, of a team I've done this with my teams and it really helped me um, be able to assign certain tasks to certain people where I knew that they would thrive um, as somebody who's worked in people operations in the past and who's an introvert um, engaging with hundreds of employees face to face every single day is really incredibly taxing for me so I hired an extrovert on my team who was 
fully um, responsible for onboarding and absolutely loved onboarding individual humans um, in mass uh, any given day. So um, those are just some, some hacks that I think are uh, really effective in the workplace to um, give people the freedom to be who they are create that shared language and then work around work an environment um, work to build an environment that supports and uh, encourages and influences folks um, and meets them where they are you're right because the the virtual world that still many of us are involved in is incredibly exhausting um, paul i think you were one of the first on our team to talk about red yellow green mm -hmm. And it was the opportunity when we started a team meeting for us to do a quick touch base of how everybody was doing without fully putting people on the spot that maybe were not comfortable sharing, but it gave people a glimpse into each other's lives and how they could follow up with somebody afterwards. Can you share more about that, Paul? I think you're giving, wasn't it you that came up with that? Or Matt Henry? It, well, it sure, it sure, it well I gave me. you all the credit. Uh, that's fine, and I'll you take did it. not take it. I'll take it. But okay. So, the, the idea was, and, and, and you can't do this all the time because it would get trite, but during the pandemic when we pivoted to work from home, it was crisis mode and nobody knew what the heck was happening and there was lots of work to do and it was an emergency situation in some ways from a business perspective. When we showed up to a meeting internal only, we just, everybody did a quick check in and said, are you red, yellow, green, right? So we knew what people's color was. Red is, hey, I'm, I'm kind of a mess right now. I'm struggling. Yellow was like, yeah, I've been worse, I've been better, but I'm okay. Green's like, we're good. And that way you sort of knew how to engage with and handle the, 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 the you know, if somebody who was, like if I showed up red and I was quiet, but didn't tell anybody, people would be like, what's wrong with Paul? Well, now they know, look, there's something going on. And people then had the opportunity to disclose what was behind that red, yellow, or green. They, didn't, they weren't forced to, weren't asked to, but it was just known that if you want to share why, you certainly can, but you don't have to. And I think that helped people um, create a habit of comfort of disclosing what they were bringing to the situation. We didn't do it when we were externally facing with the clients or partners, but we, we still do some of that a little bit internally, like, hey, man, I'm having a, and it, it sort of created this habit of like, I'm having a rough day, you know, and I need you to know about it. I'm not showing up as fully me. I'm gonna contribute as much as I can. But if you're expecting 100%, Paul, you're only getting 20% today. Okay, you know, that's fine. And it provided people with an opportunity to follow up with you privately yes. afterwards, which I know so many people took advantage of that. So yeah. we're going to transition to Q&A time right now. So if you have a question here, go ahead and, and raise your hand, or if you've submitted them online, we're going to now have our speakers answer some of your questions. Can I start with a question? Um, sure, Paul. I don't know. I always get nervous when you so, when you go out of the it's script. For Meg. It's for oh, Meg. perfect. So you mentioned you do policy and advocacy work. What is happening right now, or what should be probably what should be happening at the state legislative level when it comes to uh, mental health, well-being in the workplace? Great question, and the short answer is not enough. Um, I will speak more uh, around federal uh, policy and legislation because that's where the work that I do um, mainly lies. And um, so there, I, I shouldn't say not enough. Uh, of course, we are working in the right direction. I think that this is late coming and um, unfortunately, to your point, has been catalyzed by a global catastrophe and pandemic. Um, but a couple of exciting developments that are happening. Um, 988 is being rolled out this year and that is um, that will be um, a crisis hotline that can be called um, in place of 911. Um, so rather than sending law enforcement to mental health to address mental health crises um, in the moment there will be trained mental health counselors um, as I'm sure you're aware just through your work with a mental health first aid um, who will be on the ready to address mental health crises so I think that's uh, great and moving in the right direction um, moving uh, toward more subsidized health care um, in mental health um, working with insurance uh, organizations to quite frankly force them to cover mental health um, health care uh, is a really important movement that is um, slow but happening and um, there are, you know, peer-to-peer -peer counseling is becoming um, more and more um, funded through policy and through the federal government, um, which I think is important. Um, but I would also say that if you look at 
what the administration is doing now and then really think about what you can do as a leader within your organization to emulate a lot of those things that could go a long way because if you consider your organization as as a, a mini it's a community right it's a structure you have your own structures and systems um, and so right now if your health care provider or your insurance provider doesn't offer um, coverage of mental health care how can you help subsidize those costs for your employees um, so that's when I think about the how we can take the work that's happening at the federal level very slowly um, and implement or emulate that in workplaces that was a great <laughs> question I always get nervous with you Paul yeah yeah, that was a great question, thank you. Um, Meg, this question is for you. For our leaders of color that work in predominantly um, white industries, white companies, what are some things that organizations can do to increase inclusion, increase equity for leaders of color, especially as it pertains to their mental health? I mean, I think just recognizing that disparity exists yeah. is a good start, and then what's a step beyond that? So I'm gonna speak to something that I've been working very closely on uh, more recently with a client that I think is incredibly important and often overlooked, and that's understanding white supremacy and white dominant culture in the workplace. Um, because it be through white dominant culture, we're creating um, environments where oftentimes people of color really struggle to thrive and um, you know that is anything from uh, reimagining a sen you know sense of urgency and hustle culture um, understanding that setting very clear expectations um, is in and of itself a, a form of equity um, if you think about how uh, the workplace has, we've sort of created a lot of these unspoken uh, and informal structures in our workplace through a very specific uh, person, a very specific group of people, um, basically Paul, thank you Paul, um, and when we just sort of expect people to be able to navigate that naturally and inherently, we are doing people of color a big disservice, both mentally and professionally, uh, so I think setting clear expectations is really important in uh, being equitable equitable and inclusive. Um, yeah, I think those are the two big things right now, just like really recognizing and acknowledging white dominant culture. And it's a really hard thing to do. Like it is much easier said than done because when you're working within an organization, like combating things like sense of urgency or unrealistic expectations, perfectionism is, is, is a, I think a, oftentimes um, an expectation that we all face uh, within the organization and just getting to the point where you recognize it doesn't have to be this way. Yeah. Uh, Paul, an extension of that question, you've been a leader at your organization, you're a leader in the community, you've had a number of people under your care that you're responsible for, for individuals of color, for leaders of color, how do you maybe structure a meeting with a leader, a meeting with a manager? I mean, what are some things that you as the leader can do to really try to set a safe space and create that? And how would you empower a leader of color to be able to bring something to the table? Yeah, this is a tough question as a cisgender, heterosexual, white, Christian male, right? Like, I don't think I have a great answer. I'm the problem. Well, the environment that my people have created are the problem. And what I think works for anybody, regardless of how they identify, whether they're a majority or minority group. Um, as a leader, I always ask my people to, they, they get to be in charge of the agenda of our meetings. It's their meeting, not mine. I make that clear. And I think that transcends any identity group because then you get to show up as who you are with what you need at the time you need it. Um, and so when I lead people, I say this agenda, you need to provide an agenda, you know, by the time we start to talk, you need to come forward with an agenda. It's, we're, we're going to make this your meeting, not mine. And uh, I think that helps. Uh, it's a small thing to do. And um, I do believe it transcends any identity group or majority or minority. And then what do you do with that information? The agenda? With information that somebody brings to you. Oh, I mean, listen. Yeah. <laughs> listen and empower them and try to remove obstacles and barriers. Um, I think that's all you can do. And that, that's for anybody you lead. Right? That's what ultimately employees want. You know, they're led. 
Uh, Meg, for anybody looking for more resources, peer resources, professional resources, can you share some, some sites they can go to, maybe some local groups? Uh, what can they do right after they leave to get some additional resources? Absolutely. Um, so I think my go-to uh, group and um, resource uh, site today is Mental Health Coalition, and I say that for a couple of reasons. One, I think that their um, resources are incredibly uh, robust, but two, uh, the messaging is incredibly modern and accessible in terms of language, and I think that that is really, really important. There are also incredible um, organizations like NAMI and MHA uh, that have both local and national chapters and really um, helpful, useful resources, but if you're looking specifically for something that you can um, take back to your organization, you can um, get, you know, quick guidance on how to advocate for mental health. Mentalhealthcoalition.org is an incredible resource. And their branding is like spot on and just it's a beautiful user experience. So, yeah. For, do you want to add anything to that, Paul? You know, I've also noticed the emergence of uh, employee resource groups, which I think can be quite powerful when done well. They can also be very damaging <laughs> when done poorly. <laughs> if they're performative, uh, just like anything else that's performative. But if you're in an organization that truly takes uh, inclusion, uh, belonging quite seriously, then you're probably in a place where employee resource groups exist and have a powerful voice in the workplace. So look for that. Um, if they don't already exist, you could be the catalyst to create it. Uh, partner with a, a, you know, an executive sponsor who you trust and uh, the people operations or HR team, and you can start to create employee resource groups. Or, they can be done really well. Do we have any other questions from the audience or online? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So we talked a little bit about this, things you can do as a leader in those one-on-one -on -one conversations uh, to really help bring mental health and well-being to the forefront um, Paul, you talked about you know creating a space for people to, to share, to listen, then being able to act on that. Um, what are some final thoughts that both of you have? You know, as we have a captive room of 30 people, as we have people online, what do you want them to know about mental health, whether it's for themselves, as they go back to their organizations, as they show up in the community? What would you say, Meg? Yeah, so something that came up as you were talking through um, meeting culture and, and what that really looks like in ways that you can um, set the stage. I think one, one thing that is incredibly important, it's a small change that I've seen um, in leaders and it's I think makes a big impact and that is explicitly asking what someone needs in the, in the moment. Do they need a space to, to, to be heard and for you to just listen? Uh, do they want or need advice or do they need you to solve a problem for them? I think oftentimes as leaders, we kind of embody this, um, this role of problem solver. So if someone in, on your team comes to you and, and says, uh, you know, kind of expresses a challenge that they're facing, they might just in that moment need to be heard. Uh, they may be looking for advice or they may need or want you to solve it all together. And I think understanding that up front and giving people permission to have any of those opportunities to engage with you um, is really, really powerful. It was year 15 of my marriage that I figured out when my spouse, Amy, came to me and had a challenge that I had to ask her, is this where I'm solving the problem with you, solving the problem for you, or just listening and encouraging? And the last uh, seven years of our marriage have been much better because of my awareness. That's, that's brilliant. And any social relationship, work, personal, social, doesn't matter. I, I do think the other thing that you shared earlier that I want to reiterate, words matter, right? So like, I think there's just something super loaded when we say mental health. I think an easier word to use in the workplace that is unloaded is emotional well-being. Like that's pretty easy to approach. So if you go to talk to a manager or a leader ab about this concept, this world of mental health, start with a word like emotional well-being. It's not offensive. It's approachable. Everybody wants it. Everybody's supposed to have it. Um, and so words really matter. So how you use words in the workplace can make a huge difference uh, with leaders and those you lead. Okay, final question. If people want to contact you, if they want to follow your work, if they want to ask about an emotional support rabbit, how do they get in touch with you? Um, so I can be reached via email, uh, paul.ashley at nfp.com, like Nancy Frank Paul. 
uh, com, or I'm on the interwebs, uh, the Twitters uh, there, uh, which is P.E. Ashley, like Paul Edward Ashley, so at P.E. Ashley. Be warned uh, that there will be content of children, dogs, rabbits, and lots of wine knowledge. Uh, so if you're offended by wine, then don't follow me there. If you're offended by wine, don't be. That's... <laughs> Um, so I can be found also on Twitter and Instagram at Mr. Spelled it out M I S T E R Hovius um, in both the, those avenues. But um, if you want to connect with me or um, even connect uh, with uh, or have access to different resources, you can check out Here's website. It's hereminds.co. Um, and if you want to email me directly, it's Meg M E G at hereminds.co. Awesome, Paul Meg. Thank you so much for leading us in today's conversation, for sharing vulnerably, for giving us actionable takeaways. Thank you all for joining us in person and online. If you have questions that come up, get in touch with Meg, with Paul, reach out to Juanita or reach out to your advisor. Um, and we're just grateful that we can continue this conversation around a very important topic. And we hope to see you next time. Have a great day. Thanks, everyone.